Um, but hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It's a very special live starting conversations program. And thank you to our panel, our guests. Uh, I'm Bethany Tabor and this event is hosted by the New Mexico Humanities Council. This panel and discussion program serves as the final piece in our series, History, Memory and Public Space, facilitated by Rafi and Domian. The series focused on how historical perspectives are shaped within communities. I'll, I will put a link to our YouTube playlist of all of our previous series in the chat in just a second. Um, all of the conversations between Rafi and the scholars and historians addressed this theme through an inquiry into how historical narratives are constructed and perpetuated through the use of historic sites and public space. Tonight, Rafi and his guests are going to be discussing the legacy of the Manhattan Project on the Los Alamos community and the world at large. The format of this program will be a panel discussion between the facilitator and his guest speakers, followed by uh, an open Q&A discussion um, with everyone. Uh, when we open the room for questions, uh, you can feel free to type your questions in the chat. Uh, Rafi and I can read them aloud or you can click on the raise hand icon in Zoom and uh, Rafi will call on you and you can ask your question out loud. Um, you can also offer commentary throughout uh, via the chat. Um, and now to introduce our panel. First, Rafi E. Andonian is a best-selling author of three books. He has previously worked guiding visitors at the Gettysburg Battlefield, the Civil War sites around Richmond, the Martin Luther King birth home in Atlanta, and the History Museum in Los Alamos, New Mexico. He has a master's degree in history and another master's degree in historic preservation. He is joined by Nancy R. Bartlett. The year Bartlett received her degree in history from Smith College, she began teaching English at a women's college in Sendai, Japan, 13 years after World War II ended. She built on this experience in cross-cultural communications, her UNN master's thesis and degree, to become the council chair of Los Alamos. Beginning in 1998, she worked with Santa Feans to place a city marker at the former internment campsite. In Los Alamos, she led the placing and dedication of bronze statues of Manhattan Project leaders, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer and General Leslie Groves. An author, she traveled to Pacific World War II sites and war and peace museums, including Hiroshima and Nagasaki, then applied these experiences in talks she gave at Timian Island, Bataan Surrender Ceremony, Navajo Land, and around the Southwest. Elva K. Osterreich has been a journalist, photographer, and editor in Southern New Mexico for 20 years. She has written thousands of articles about the state's history, people, and environment for newspapers and magazines. Falling in love with the people and the history of the area, she especially loves the stories she hears from the old timers and is fascinated by the way folks used to live there, used to live and their experiences. Combining her interest in the people of the area and the immense power and effect of the Trinity atomic bomb explosion is a natural progression into exploration for Osterite. She is the author of the Manhattan Project Trinity Test, Witnessing the Bomb in New Mexico, which was recently named the best new book by a New Mexico author by the Santa Fe Reporter. Paul W. Tibbetts IV received his commission through the US Air Force Academy in 1989. Following graduation, he served in a variety of operational assignments as a B-1 and B-2 pilot. The general commanded the 393rd Bomb Squadron and the 509th Bomb Wing, both assigned to 8th Air Force. He flew combat missions in support of operations in Southwest Asia, the Balkans, and Afghanistan, and was awarded the Bronze Star and Distinguished Flying Cross. Paul retired from the U.S. Air Force as a Brigadier General with more than 4,000 flying hours after nearly 30 years of service. He is currently the president and owner of Strike Advanced Solutions, LLC, as an independent consultant. Additionally, Paul is a first officer for FedEx Express, flying the B-777. With that, Rafi, I will let you take it away. Thanks, Bethany, and thank you to the New Mexico Humanities Council for hosting this entire series from the spring to now into the fall. And thank you to my panelists. I want to start out first to have each of our panelists talk about um, their connection to the Manhattan Project and its legacies. I invited each of our panelists because um, each person has very direct personal experiences interacting with Manhattan Project um, stuff <laughs> in various ways, uh, with lived experience, with career, with um, very direct um, you know, interviews and research. And so I want us to kind of introduce 
the panelists and their direct connections. And I'm gonna start with Paul. Well, good evening, Rafi. Thank you, and Bethany. Uh, I'd also like to thank the, uh, the New Mexico Humanities Council. This is a great honor to be here with uh, my esteemed colleagues uh, and a uh, pleasure to, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, my tie in here with, uh, with the uh, Manhattan Project. First, I'd like to say, Bethany mentioned about my career. I spent 30 years in the Air Force, uh, but my entire career really focused around the nuclear deterrent. Uh, I entered the Air Force in the B-1 while we still had SAC, Strategic Air Command around and into the B-2 and spent an entire career circling around this very important mission for our nation and for the world, uh, including uh, multiple assignments. I uh, was overseas at uh, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, as well as U.S. Strategic Command in Omaha, Nebraska, working this same kind of work. But what Rafi wants me to mention is uh, my direct tie is actually uh, by birth. Uh, I am Paul Tibbetts IV, as Bethany said, and it is a truly an honor to be a Paul Tibbetts. I say that all the time and I mean it. Uh, most kids when they were young had heroes. Uh, you pick them, you name them. Some of them uh, are interesting and, and you know, collectively they're certainly uh, broad and diverse. My hero is my grandfather. And uh, watching what he did uh, with the uh, atomic bomb mission in World War II, and just to be very clear, Paul Tibbetts Jr was the pilot of the Enola Gay, which dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. He was also the commander of the 509th Composite Group, uh, which was the organization that dropped both atomic bombs. And so he was charged with planning, organizing, and executing those missions uh, that helped to bring about the end of World War II. So that's why I'm proud to be a Paul Tibbetts, and I'm certainly honored to be here with my esteemed colleagues today, so thank you. Thanks, Paul, I appreciate it. And when I first met Paul and um, we were talking about this, it was really fascinating because I was in his, uh, I was in his home because of, because of something else. And um, I, noticed, I noticed the World War II and, and uh, Enola Gay and, and Manhattan Project kind of uh, photos and memorabilia around. And I realized, oh my gosh, you're that Paul Tibbetts. <laughs> so we had a great conversation and a friendship and of course um, has led to this. So I really appreciate you being here, Paul means a lot to me and, and it just goes to show you how, how you can kind of connect with people in, 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 in uh, unexpected ways, right? As you, as you go out and about. Yes, sir, my pleasure. Now, Nancy, Nancy Bartlett, I've known you for years. And um, how, about, how about you uh, say a little bit about yourself and your ties to the Manhattan Project? Well, I'm a child of the Manhattan Project. I found out when I went to visit Oak Ridge for uh, uh, a gathering of all the both civilian and military children of the Manhattan Project because my father helped to build the K-25 plant, which was the distillation plant for the uranium-235. And um, when I got uh, my rental car at the airport, guess what was printed on the license plate? 1663, and that's the P.O. box that the Los Alamos people during the Manhattan Project used while they were getting their mail. So um, it's uh, there's all kinds of interesting, wonderful things that serendipitously I learned about. But I'm more than a historian. I'm a, what they call a participant observer. I'm old enough to have experienced World War II. I was just, I just entered kindergarten in New Jersey uh, when the war started, Pearl Harbor started. And for all those war years, I was frightened about the Germans attacking us on the Atlantic. My mother said I used to hide under the bed because I would be frightened by the searchlights that would uh, be in the darkness. And of course, all the things that you've learned about those times uh, where we had to have, well, we had a, a, a garden for food. Uh, we had to have black shades in the window, had to go to bed at eight o'clock, turn the lights out, uh, those kinds of things. And I remember um, fighting with my mother about what kind of shoes I could wear because you could only get one pair. And then, of course, you outgrow them. 
And she wanted something sturdy and I wanted something fancy. You know how that goes. So that's part of my memory. Um, life is very interesting. When I grew up uh, in the East Coast of Philadelphia, uh, I went to school in Massachusetts. I never knew that I would be involved at all with World War II. <laughs> um, uh, just for the young people, I was um, asked, by, I tried to find out what I should do. And, and we weren't women where they're not trained to be career, have careers. Um, and so I asked a woman, Dr. Wilson, who had survived the bombing of London. Uh, what, what, uh, sorry, the phone is ringing. Um, what I should do. And she said, well, um, you should do something that you know nothing about. And you should do, learn something that you can be a scintillating conversationalist when you marry a professional man. And that was the advice I got from a historian, my professor. I'm kind of taking a long time here, but John Bartlett, my husband, brought me to Japan, brought me to Los Alamos after I taught in Japan for two years. And uh, that's how I am personally connected. And maybe some of the other questions or things that you tell me, I'll, and I'll embellish. Sounds good. And Nancy, I, um, uh, Nancy, of course, lives in Los Alamos. And I used to live in Los Alamos and uh, work at the History Museum there. And that's how I met Nancy. And we've had a um, uh, relationship ever since. In, in a variety of contexts, again, friendship and learning a lot from you and, and from you and great conversations. And uh, given your experience, I really appreciate having your voice on here, Nancy. Thank you. It's a wonderful privilege to meet Paul Tibbetts, the grandson of a man that made a difference in our world, and to meet Elva and learn more about the Trinity site that she's going to talk about. Absolutely. Um, so, Elva. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself and your connections next. Um, of course, I met Elva um, because of her book um, and, and um, her book has, has done very well and, and has very direct ties to the legacies of Manhattan Project, something that we talk about um, throughout the series as, as um, uh, one of the themes that runs throughout our topics. And of course, what we're talking about today. So Elva, go ahead and introduce yourself and your ties to the Manhattan Project. Um, well, I live in southern New Mexico. I worked I was a journalist with the Alamogordo Daily News for 16 years. Um, and as such, I met and became friends with a great many of the, the older people in the area. They had some wonderful, wonderful tales to tell. And on the 60th anniversary of the Trinity test, as a newspaper, we all came together and talked to many of the people who, who were, had memories of the event. And I pulled together some of the older pieces from the paper when, it, when the things were happening. And we put together a, a commemorative edition. Um, and so that was a very fascinating and fun project for me. Uh, so I just, have became really interested in what people had to say and in the points of view that come out of the what happened at, during the test and after it. Um, I, my personal connection with World War II doesn't really have anything to do with the Trinity test. Um, it's, it's as my family, when my mother was young, uh, she and her mother and her siblings fled Estonia in the midst of Russian tank fire on a on a fishing boat, and so um, it just everything seems to come back to that war, no matter where I turn. So it's been interesting. Yeah, thank you, Elva, and and I think one of the themes I see with our different panelists here today is each have direct personal and family ties with the Manhattan Project and World War II, um, which are of course intertwined, as well as career ties. Each of them 
has uh, done in their own ways in their career and professionally, um, you know, things that are related to this uh, subject that continues to this day. And um, so I'm really glad to have these voices here together. We have a few questions that we're going to kind of kick off um, the discussion with so that this way you all have some idea of some of their thoughts, some insight that they provide. And I really want our audience to have questions um, as part of this uh, exercise, because part of the reason we did this live is so you have direct access to being able to talk to these folks. As you know, on the previous parts of the series, we've done recorded um, panel discussions with the topics of history, memory, and public sites. And we decided to do a cap off with these folks here with our panelists live so you have direct access to these voices which is an uncommon opportunity so what i ask with the questions is that um, if you would like to jump in uh, in in person then then do the little raise hand icon in the chat um, at, on your screen as bethany said but i also encourage you to put in some questions in the chat sometimes i know that when the speaker is making a point uh, there's a question that's on your mind in that moment that is very direct and relevant to what they're saying now that may not be there at the end of the topic or at the end of the talk, maybe 20 minutes later. So feel free to put the questions in the chat as we go through. Based on sort of how the conversation flows, I may or may not take that and uh, quickly put it into the flow of things or I may hold it a little bit later. But if you put it there, I know that it's in the queue and it's there. And I'll, I'll decide based on the flow of the conversation where the questions go. So I want you to interact in this process. So to kick it off for our panelists, given your experiences, how do you understand what history is from your experiences? What is history? This is one of our topics that we kind of started uh, in this discussion in this series. Uh, our first uh, panel was called was on the topic of history and trying to define it. But we have different people here today with very direct experiences. So I want to kind of get a sense of what you think history is. So Paul, I'm going to start with you. Okay, Rafi, thanks. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I have some thoughts on this from uh, the perspective of kind of my career and my grandfather. And uh, what I'd like to frame it or how I'd like to frame it is to talk about deterrence. You know, history informs the future. It, you know, we've heard many people over the years say, hey, if we don't understand history, then we, it's, uh, we dare to repeat it. It might be good or it might be bad. Uh, but for sure, you know, in my sense, history informs the future. Um, and the way I'd like to frame that is through deterrence and, and what deterrence means. And so when I look at uh, my grandfather and the beginnings of, of this idea of using uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrent, um, I had a lot of experience throughout my career with that. And when I consider what that means is from a historical perspective, it's very, very interesting because uh, World War II was devastating. Uh, the loss of life was, was just enormous. Uh, however, since that time, uh, of course, we've had conflict, we've had loss of life, and even one loss of life uh, is tragic. Uh, but, but through the time since the end of the war, it's been a very, very uh, small number compared to the numbers we lost in World War II. And many people could say, well, why is that? You know, what, what changed? Well, uh, I would argue that nuclear weapons is what changed and the deterrent is what changed. Um, and the reason I want to make this point is because not only do we have a deterrent that, and we, that, we, that we use, but we have a deterrent where we've not actually dropped a nuclear weapon since the end of World War II, since my grandfather's day. Um, but I don't want it to fall short on your audience that by what I mean by that is that although we haven't used one in anger, we use this deterrent, these weapons every day to deter our allies so that we don't have that type of conflict that I just mentioned so that we don't have that loss of life. So we don't have major superpowers engaged with each other with a horrific number of lives that could be lost. And so I think this underpinning of our national security, this underpinning of what allows basically everything else to happen uh, is this nuclear deterrent. Uh, it doesn't mean it's just all that powerful. It, it is some, some kind of magic, it's not at all. But our, our enemies, our adversaries, we all understand the capabilities uh, of our foes. And we, in this particular case, don't want this capability to ever actually target people again. And so by using it as a deterrent, uh, we have avoided that type of catastrophic loss of life. So 
history informs the future. Uh, history has played a huge role from the Cold War and even to today. And so I'll close with this is the Cold War's over. Well, but not really. Uh, yeah, the Cold War ended, but we still have major adversaries. We still have huge challenges in our world today. And the nuclear deterrent, this deterrent is alive and well, and we, we desperately need it to be to be credible in the eyes of our adversaries, which it is. And this is why you continue to see it get modernized. And also that there's a will to use it. Um, there's no mistaking there. And so I'm grateful to all of America, Americans who support this because I spent a career uh, oftentimes trying to explain to people what the deterrent meant because they said, why do you spend all this money on nuclear weapons? Why do you want to do all these kinds of things that are, that are horrible? Uh, well, of course they are. But the point is, is that it's provided us this level of, of, uh, of peace. I call it kind of the strategic level of peace, even in the midst of all the chaos that happens. I'll stop there. So is it fair to say, Paul, that in, in your view that, that history is a way to help us remember and inform uh, current policy and how we understand the potential uh, you know, impact and effect of those policies and what could happen? Uh, this is why Rafi, I, you're the you're the moderator, and I'm here to join you. Uh, absolutely, and 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 not not to be tongue in cheek about this. I mean, let's let's be serious. Uh, uh, this is why I made the point that the nuclear deterrent is alive and well, and this is why I also want to make sure that your audience understands that, you know, uh, as my grandfather, you know, said in his day, war is horrible. I mean, you know, th what we went through was horrible, but but what we have today is the opportunity to not see that again in that type of that level, and so yes, absolutely. As you know, we continue to review these policies. We continue to revisit the utility of this type of weaponry and this type of mission. It's a mission of deterrence. And that I don't think that will ever change. So absolutely. Awesome, thank you. Nancy, what do you think history is? Given your experiences and, and you have, I know you have many and you kind of started touching on it in the introduction. Uh, what, what do you think history is? What is practice history and how, how do we use it? Well, I've thought about this a long time with the, your question. And I think history is the way wisdom is uh, shared with the contemporary world and also the future world. And the way there, I've listed, I don't know, 25 different ways that we teach history and the facts and what's happened. And for me as a historian, uh, I love to travel to the places that I talk about. And I've been to all the places that are the key places for the Manhattan Project, either by myself on my own nickel or on tours, or when we were setting up the Manhattan Project National Historic Park. When I give talks, of, I, I wrote a book, and when I give talks about the chapters in the books, I begin with this quote, which I think tells it all. I'm gonna read it so I don't misquote it. It's, I'll tell you who it's from after I finish. History with its flickering lamp stumbles along the trail of the past, trying to reconstruct its scenes, to revive its echoes and kindle with pale gleams the passion of former days. And that's what I try to do as an historian is to, to have people try to understand both sides of the story. And I, when I get, once I get going, I get very passionate because I have, my stories rely on my interviews with living people who experienced what I'm teaching. In, in addition to my research, am I going to the places? And, um, and I find that I'm like a detective uh, trying to put a puzzle together. There are pieces that are missing and, uh, and, and serendipitously you encounter the answers. And this isn't an academic answer to you, to your question, but it's what I've experienced uh, and I enjoy being a historian and I try to tell the facts. And my having lived in Japan and been trained by um, my, 
he was a grandfather. He was the grandson of a samurai. He was the head of the of the metallurgical division at the university where I lived in Sand Sendai, and had gone to MIT as a graduate student. And he taught me the appro appropriate culture of Japan. He wouldn't let me go to a place where it was inappropriate for a woman to go, et cetera, et cetera. And so I learned the culture and the way uh, the Japanese make decisions. And that knowledge has helped me understand why it took so long for Japan to surrender after two atomic bombs and the Russian invasion, which they weren't concerned about. They, they are, the, Japan was still going to continue the war and the emperor was not in charge like President Truman was. So these differences I try to explain to Americans who look at what happened in Japan from a Western point of view. And that's not the way we should work with our, our allies. It's a lesson of wisdom, of learning how the pe people you wanna get along with think. And then hopefully that brings peace and understanding. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, so, so for you then history is, as you said, you know, wisdom to help us maybe it's guide and navigate understanding. And that's something um, that can be seen in so many different ways. I think history has so much complexity and it helps us get informed and see more sides to a story as we, as we see the world around us. Exactly. Now, Elva, um, speaking of which, I, I wanna hear your perspective on, on what history is. I know you've, as, as you said earlier, you've had a lot of exposure to different perspectives. So from, from your experiences, what do you think that history is? So I think that Nancy kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, it, it's a lot of different perspectives. And what that says to me is that it's almost entirely subjective. That it's the point of view of the person who is seeing it from all the people I talked to and the people that I read about and shared in my book. It, it's all different. Um, I mean, facts aside, I'm not even sure that there's a way to actually dig up facts because it's it's so. Um, the important part of it is the stories and how people pull them together and what people do with that. Um, the lesson of, of just understanding things from different perspectives, I think is probably the most important part. Um, I guess the other part of that is, is not only is it subjective, but it's sometimes created. Um, as an example, the when the Trinity test went off, um, the story was created and put out that what happened was a munitions dump explosion at the Holloman Air Base, and, and it had nothing to do with a, what it actually was. And nobody knew until until the well. I don't. I won't say nobody knew. Certainly, plenty of people knew, but many of the community members just didn't know what happened. Uh, they knew something happened, but they were told something completely different than what happened. And how um, how much does that happen? I mean, how how do we know that any of the official information we get is accurate in some kind of reasonable way? So let me let me stick with you on this next question because I think you're you're sort of drifting towards this question that I have, uh, which is what in your in your view what is the legacy of the Manhattan Project and 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 why you know whatever your answer is why why do you think so? Uh, so the the legacy that I see and that I would talk about is is not the wider picture. Um, it's the very narrow picture of the the Tuosa Basin and the communities of Southern New Mexico. Um, 
whom this, this legacy affected a great deal, the personal legacies of the people who feel like they, um, they had cancers and fallout and problems stemming from that event is one of the details. Uh, they have so far not been recognized by the government. Uh, Nancy t shared earlier that, that there's another bill that's been introduced. Um, it, bills have been introduced before and they have not succeeded. And those, those peoples, those families, the, the ones that were affected by the cancers and stuff, their, their whole trajectory changed. The whole family legacy changes. So what happens with history is that an event happens and then everything is different. Um, for example, many of the people who were there, who experienced, who resulted with cancers and stuff, their family legacies went toward and their efforts and energies went toward healing or cures. They went to hospitals, they went to funerals um, and it completely disrupted the, the natural flow of a family they couldn't leave their children anything because their energy and pain went towards something else. And that, that hurts, that it leaves a, a painful legacy for those people. Uh, the other thing is the, the ranchers, there were ranchers that were removed from their homes and ranches and never went back. And although they received some compensation for their properties, they never received enough. And so these people, their children who should have grown up out there herding the cattle and riding the horses and learning how to live off the land, they ended up in little houses in the towns because they didn't have the, the wherewithal to grow up the way that their parents and their grandparents and their pioneer grandparents intended them to. So, so those are just. Oh, oh sorry. Direct, I just those are some of the direct, um, the direct legacies that I have seen. So Paul, what's what's your opinion on on? I, I think Elva brings a, a interesting point on kind of how she started saying the wider view versus the narrower view and. And she provides kind of a view that's very localized, right? To where, where she is with the people there. Um, Paul, I'd love to hear your perspective because I, my sense is that you kind of see both a wider and narrower view as well. And, and um, given your career experience, given your family ties, given your, uh, your many conversations with your grandfather. So what's the legacy of the Manhattan Project for you? And, and, and can you speak a little bit to what Elvis said as well? Certainly, no, and I, I really enjoyed listening to all those comments. I think it's very pertinent to the discussion we're having and, and the realities of something when something like this happens. Um, behind me, by the way, is a legacy lithograph. I wanted to make sure to tell your audience about that. It's a painting my grandfather commissioned uh, to honor the 509th um, or the legacy between the two of us, which was in the 509th. Um, in the foreground, the giant airplane is the B-2. And in the background, which is hard to see, I'm sure, on this discussion is the Enola Gay ghosted in the background. Uh, my grandfather being the founder of the 509th Composite Group, which is now today's 509th Bomb Wing, uh, flying the B-2. Uh, so I just wanted to share that with your audience. Um, did I disappear? Yes, yes Paul, your, your video just went off. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. You know, you think I know how to work a computer and I don't. Um, uh, so back to the discussion again. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I would like to share, I, I, Nancy uh, shared a quote a minute ago, and I'd like to share a quote as well. What I was trying to do is do that. There's my grandfather and I in the B-29, so we'll leave that up for a second. We actually did fly it together, by the way. Um, I'd like to share a quote about my grandfather, and I think it touches on uh, Elvis' point here. Uh, well, in fact, I know it does. Um, 
and then I'll address it a little bit further. So um, my grandfather said in, in regards to this mission that we were just talking about, uh, the mission is on August 6th and 9th of 1945. Um, and I'm gonna read it as well. My grandfather said, it's a devastating thing. It came as a tremendous surprise. It shocked people. Uh, if people could see the attitude that we have, the patriotism we had at the time, the sincerity of our beliefs today, I wanted to do everything that I could to subdue Japan. That was the attitude of the United States in those years. The 509th Composite Group was a great group of patriotic men. They all put their backs to the wheel and we succeeded in bringing that carnage to an end and everybody got to go home. And so, you know, my grandfather's quote, uh, that was just uh, probably four or five years before he passed away. So this is, you know, this was fairly recent for, for him. He passed away in 2007. Uh, but the point of that and what I'd like to, to, to talk about is that these men that were serving during this time uh, had a job to do. And uh, the, the orchestrator, if you will, that the orders were coming from the president of the United States. And the guys, the men and women today that are serving in the military are executing the orders of their, of their leadership. Uh, and many times that gets confused. And my grandfather was trying to say here is we did the best we could because we felt like if we were successful, we could bring the warden in and stop the hurting uh, that was happening and uh, move on with our lives. My grandfather met with President Truman in 1948, so a few years after the war. And in that room were some very high level uh, military officials that the president wanted to thank for their involvement uh, in the war. One example would be Jimmy Doolittle. Uh, we're all familiar with his mission. Uh, during the war and how, how effective that was uh, in the beginning days of World War II for the United States. Um, so uh, he had these, these gentlemen there and he was discussing um, and thanking them for their part in the war. The entire time they were sitting in front of the president, my grandfather was sitting on the side of the president and my grandfather was a colonel. I mean, he was just a you know, relatively uh, you know, uh, younger ranking person and was not sure why he was sitting at the president's side until about 30 minutes into the conversation, the president finished addressing the men in front of him. And my grandfather was sitting there, of course, the whole time. He turned to look at my grandfather. Well, I looked this way because he's in the way, that way in the picture, right? He turned and looked at my grandfather and uh, he said, so Paul, what do you think? And my grandfather was a bit stunned because he's like, why is the president, you know, what do you mean, what do I think? And my grandfather said, you just, I just said the first thing that came in my mind. And he said, well, Mr. President, I, I, I think I did what I was supposed to do. And the president looked at him and said, and slammed his fist down on the table and said, uh, you're damn right you did. And I'm the one that sent you. So if anybody gives you a hard time, you send them to me. Um, and you know, th this story he used to tell at many, many gatherings that uh, I was able, fortunate enough to attend uh, later in his later years. Uh, and you would see the audience kind of shake their head and go, oh, I get that. Because what the president was saying was, hey, so for the rest of your life, you're going to live with this, uh, but I'm the one that actually ordered you to do it. You just carried out my orders. And so uh, I, I think that probably gives you a good sense and your audience a good sense of what the, my, my legacy of the Manhattan Project is or how I see that legacy through my grandfather. And also how I see that legacy today, because I spent 30 years in the military. I had my own career and I understood the entire time I was serving that I was serving, uh, uh, you know, for those uh, that, that uh, decided what our military was gonna do, and what we were not gonna do. Uh, we, just, we just carried out those orders and we did the best job that we could in hopes every time, no matter what was happening, that it was for the greater good. Um, and so back to the beginning of the conversation we said with Elva, when we think about uh, many people have sacrificed because of wars in the past and wars of today. Um, and but some of those are military and some of those are civilian and every life that's lost, every casualty that happens is, is tragic. Uh, but the hope is, is that we can make decisions that are for the greater good so that we can, like in this case, when the war ended, we, you know, my grandfather used to say, we saved generations of people and we saved thousands of lives of folks that, that would likely have been lost had we had invaded Japan. Uh, so that's my thoughts. Can I speak up now? Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. Thank you, Paul. That was, that was really I, insightful. I, I think both of you have contributed a great deal to the story, and I'd like to uh, expand on it. Um, I interviewed the men who were on the Bataan Death March who spent three and a half years as pr prisoners of war. 
only half of them came home. Only 20 of the men that were sent over in the uh, fall of 41 to the Philippines were killed by the Japanese before the surrender in May. But half of them died from, from the cruelty of the prison camps, as, as Paul talked about. Those men would not have come home if it hadn't been for the atomic bombs. So there were 900 men that made it back. We lost about a third from who didn't make it after they came back to America because of their physical condition. But 600, this is a round number, of the men came back to New Mexico and had families. And because of the bomb, uh, they lived. They would not have made it for an invasion. They would have been killed by an order of the, the uh, officer in, in Japan who sent out a command to all, all the camp commanders to, un, to exterminate. I use the word exterminate. My daughter says I shouldn't use it, but it, it, it was to totally uh, erase any trace of any POW. And we're talking about thousands of, of uh, allied prisoners. That's one case. The other thing about it was when the war stopped in August, September, not in November or the following year, the Japanese Americans that were interred in the Santa Fe, the men that were there because they were considered dangerous enemy aliens by virtue of being of Japanese descent, they got to go home. The Santa Fe camp was not closed until April of 1946. So they, and there are reasons, but the war gave them back their lives as well. The Navajos came home and they had their cleansing ceremonies and took the GI Bill and became educators. That's another uh, uh, result of the atomic bomb. But I would like to go back to Los Alamos because I was supposed to talk about Los Alamos and and the legacy, um, Heather McClanahan is on here and Heather was on the second program and Heather's down in Las Cruces. I wanna say hi to her. Um, my biggest legacy of all the things I did in Los Alamos was to hire her as an assistant to our director. And then she became our executive director of the Los Alamos Historical Society. and. She, she championed the national park. And so I wanna tip my hat to her. The thing about Los Alamos is that the park and the legacy of what happened here has um, brought our community together in a way that I think is, was reflective during the Manhattan years. And that is the laboratory and the town, the county, and the private historical society. Now the Department of Energy and the Department of Interior because of the park are all working together and we're having a fun time working together to tell the story as accurately as we can. And we recognize the historical society is the leader in this uh, with contracts with the county, we recognize the importance of collecting and maintaining these oral histories, uh, what happened to the town. The Bradbury Science Museum, which is part of the laboratory, is telling us what happened uh, during the Manhattan Project across the bridge uh, on the canyon on the other side, which the public cannot visit at this time. It's too close to secured areas, but there is a virtual tour you can take in that museum. And also when it, Professor Rogers and I interviewed for two and a half years, we went all around the state interviewing veterans. Uh, we learned that the Manhattan Project is not just Los Alamos, it's the whole state. And that was very, very interesting the uh, department uh, 
uh, engineering department at UNM, trained Paul Tippett's grandfather um, on modifying the B-29s for the atomic bombs to fit. Oxnard Airport became the uh, Kirtland Air Force Base. Things that couldn't be done at Los Alamos were sent down to Albuquerque. And now you have a new complex, Sandia. Los Alamos Laboratory stayed on because there was a need for national security research. And um, the lab is increasing um, um, staff people a thousand a year. And we're bursting at the seams in terms of providing housing for these families that want to come. Um, the, you, the Historical Society has made connections with the Hiroshima and Nagasaki museums. And those museums are city museums. They're not national museums. I went on a private tour with a, uh, another historian from Idaho for three and a half years, uh, three and a half weeks. We went to 14 war and peace museums in Japan. And the national position is to, uh, to reduce the understanding of the Japanese aggression during World War II. To, they call it the 15 years war. But those city museums and other museums try to tell what happened. Hiroshima and Nagi said, we were a military city. The people who died in the dropping of the Hiroshima bomb, the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, were the second Japanese, the second army. Uh, we, I have between 20,000 to 30,000 members of that army that were exterminated that day when the bomb was dropped, plus 20,000 Korean conscripts. You don't hear the story that there were military people who were killed by the, that bomb. Uh, you hear women and children, old men. Well, women and children were making war things for the use of the military. Nagasaki had military uh, Mitsubishi that were making the, the, uh, um, the submarine, um, what do you call, it? I'm sorry, I'm doing a senior moment, the torpedoes. That, that whole unit was destroyed by the atomic bomb on Nagasaki. This was a war. We destroyed 63 cities by conventional bombing. Hundreds of B-29s were sent from Guam and Tinian to stop the war. And the army was, Japanese army did not want to stop the war. And so, um, but the bomb brought our men home, our men and women, who were also uh, in the Philippines, who were in POW camps. And it took me a long time to come to this position. I was a teacher, I was called uh, educational missionary. And I went to Hiroshima and Nagasaki long before I knew about Los Alamos. So when my husband brought me to Los Alamos, I didn't say a word because I didn't know how Los Alamos people thought about the legacy of the Manhattan Project. But after interviewing these veterans and saying their lives were saved, and, um, and uh, one that we interviewed, uh, Har Mr. Harmio, who started the ceremony for the Bataan uh, surrender, April 9th, every year, he told us that he threw his arms around Truman and can you imagine throwing your arms around the president of the United States? He threw his arms around Truman and thanked him. And that's my story. That's the story I tell. Los Alamos is surviving because of the Manhattan Project. It was a boys ranch school. Other ranch schools around our region uh, went bankrupt or shut down because the men were fighting overseas. Now we are the gateway to three national parks, 
the Manhattan Project National Historic Park, Bandelier, and now the um, Via Grande. So um, we're thriving and we're trying to be responsible. Our museums do not celebrate the dropping of the bombs, but we appreciate the science that happened and we try to tell the story as best we can. And uh, you can go online and you can come up and visit, take tours. We're expanding. I signed the papers for the Oppenheimer House to be a part of the Historical Society property. And now we have two of the houses that were used by Manhattan Project uh, personnel who are part of the society and part of the story. And um, maybe my husband had suggested at one time that the museums interchange and exchange uh, what uh, they can tell. Uh, uh, Hiroshima has more than a million people living there. More than a million people visit the museum. 80,000 people visit the Bradbury Science Museum and less the Historical Society. I would like to see tours that tell the whole story that go to Oak Ridge, Hanford, Los, Los Alamos, Tinian, um, uh, Tinian, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Honolulu, Iwo Jima, and know the whole story. I'm so sorry, Nancy, I, I'm, you, I, you see, I'm passionate. Nancy, <laughs> so Nancy, you're, you're kind of touching on something about kind of, um, you know, issues today. And, and so I kind of want to come back to the panel and ask the question of, you know, I mean, right now is an intense historical moment, right, in our society. I think there's a lot of things going on. And, and, and I guess what I would like to see is, is what you all think is how do you propose we approach it when you consider you know, your historical perspective with your experiences. So Elva, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Uh, you obviously have very direct experience that you were just touching on that kind of, uh, you know, sent us down this, this path in that last round. So uh, what, what would you say? I mean, with the larger context of what's going on in society and there's many things you can choose from that make it a tense historical moment. So however you interpret that and, and how your perspective informed with your historical work um, would would influence what what you consider there, or how do you in terms of approaching it? Um, I guess my perspective would be just to to understand the individual nature of of things that happen and and allow for compassion and allow for I mean people or governments tend to see the forest instead of the trees and i think the trees are are everything um if we can get people to understand what's going on um and understand each other's points of view things you know things could level out <laughs> one could always hope um I, I lost my tra my train of thought. Well, well, you were talking about, you know, I mean, uh, you're saying governments tend to see sort of the forest point of view. And, and, and I guess you were building up to telling us about what, how you think we should approach these, you know, difficult historical issues or difficult current issues in this tense historical moment, I should say. Well, we should approach I guess, part, part of, I guess part of my point was about honesty and I think we should approach it by honesty. I think human beings have a need to understand what's going on around them. Um, we have the capacity to, to understand, to, to, I mean, if, even if it's bad news, even if it's terrible stuff, it would be good for people to know what's coming. Uh, so that's one way I guess we should approach approach it. Um, yeah, and I think maybe what I'm hearing you say too is that when you made the forest comment, is it fair to say that sometimes, you know, we should um, 
consider consider also the the grassroots perspective, the bottom up perspective. You know, is it is that fair to say? I'm I'm kind of guessing a little bit from some of your work and and some of what you said about you know we tend to look. The way I interpret what you said about the forest is kind of we tend to look top down and maybe you'd like to see bottom up a little bit more from the communities. Uh, well, yes, uh, definitely bottom up from the communities, but also the, I mean, there's an attitude that the more people are involved, the more important the point of view might be. Um, I guess because part of this, what's going on in the, in the fallout area of the Trinity test is that it's comparing it to New York or comparing it to another area the quantity of human beings that are affected is not huge. Um, in fact, it's quite small. And I mean, it, it just, we need to realize that all the populations are important, not only the large ones, but also the, the smaller ones. Um, I guess that's what I was saying. Okay, yeah, Paul, Paul, what, what do you have to say? I know, again, you have a lot of experience in a variety of ways. and. And, and again, of course, you know, right now is, this, I think, an intense historical moment. And I know we've had some conversations about it ourselves. And um, how do you propose we approach it, I mean, considering the perspective that you have? Uh, sure. No, I, I, you know, this, this, uh, this time now, I'm, I'm not wearing the uniform anymore. It's interesting to be on this side of the fence. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to share one of my favorite quotes is from Ronald Reagan. He said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Uh, and so I share that because that's actually the quote that I, that when they, my my team people that I work with built me this uh, going away plaque. I said they said what what's it, what you know what's kind of an important quote to you? I said that one. Uh, and so you know if you digest that a little bit, what he's saying is um, you can't you can't uh, relish in the past. You have to continue to fight in the future. Uh, every generation, in this case, Reagan's saying it's got to step up to the plate to defend this nation. Um, and so despite the uh, uh, challenges we're facing as a nation, we can't ever forget uh, how we got to where we are. And we can't ever forget uh, what that means for the future. And, and by that, I mean, in this case, that uh, a, uh, a military that's credible, uh, that can sustain our nation's battles if required, but if not to deter our adversaries uh, is, is just as important today as it was during the Cold War. We can't forget that. Um, people, you know, we, we, uh, thought of, we won the Cold War, so uh, everything's good. And I said, well, yeah, actually it's much more complicated today. It's much more complicated today. So I think to answer your question in that way, I would say this, um, we have to continue to fight the good fight um, as a nation to, take, take, to do what's best for our citizens and of course for our friends and allies. And it's much harder now because there's so many completing interests and there's so many things happening around the world uh, that draws our attention away. And so I'm not a politician and uh, I don't play one on TV and I did not stay in a Holiday Inn Express last night. Uh, <laughs> but, but what I do know to be true, uh, as my grandfather said one day, we were standing underneath the B2 and uh, we're looking up at it. And I said, and I'm not sure I could have done this, but I said, hey, granddad, do you want to go flying in the B2 or like go up inside and look at it? And he goes, Paul, no. He said, first of all, uh, it's, it's hard for me to get into that airplane. Uh, and he said, but he said, you know, it's not important for an old guy like me to do something like that. He said, all I know is that it's important for us as a nation to continue to maintain the edge and, and maintain our security for our citizens. Uh, this B2 is part of that. That's what I need to know. And so I just need to be a citizen that supports those kinds of decisions to make sure that we're taking care of our citizens and of our friends and allies. And then I'll feel good about it. I did drag him in the sin, by the way, but that was that's another story. Um, but but his point was is what we're talking about here right now. You know, as a, a buddy of mine, uh, General Chilton, actually, who was an astronaut, he ran U.S. Strategic Command. He said one day, he said, "Spilling American blood is not success, in my view. We have to be prepared for it, uh, but deterrence is the highest calling of any military person, and I firmly believe it." So, hate to come full circle back to how I started. Uh, but um, certainly that's key to this conversation we're having today is that no matter what's happening around us and all the, all the, uh, all the, uh, all the conflicting interests and things that are happening, we have to remember that that foundation that I started off with 
and that foundation that we've maintained as a, as a nation since our beginning, really, but certainly in today's day through the last couple centuries, that foundation that we've established is still important because we do want to maintain that level of safety and security for our citizens. And, uh, Thanks, Paul. Um, and and I, think, I think something I'm taking away from what you're saying is that, you know, not only how the past informs the current and future for you, but one of the ways you'd like to see us approach these, these historical moments that we're in, both I think domestically and in foreign policy, uh, is, is to be remembering the past, if you will, to help inform what we do in the future, right? Is that, is that fair to say? Is, is that a fair understanding? Well, and, and I think I would add one, yeah, it would, Rafi, and that, but I would add to that that, uh, that that's our responsibility as a nation. So back to President Reagan's quote, right? right. Uh, you know, our responsibility is, I mean, as a nation, I mean, as citizens in our nation, as citizens, you know, less than 1% of our population actually serves the United States military today to defend the other 99%. Um, and I, 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 I just shudder at the thought that we're not capable one day of doing that. I don't think that, and I never would think that could ever happen. But I also know that it requires the sacrifice of our citizens to make sure that it doesn't. Uh, if, Thanks, I may, if I may, yeah, go ahead, Nancy. yeah um, when I was getting my master's uh, from UNM, I did my thesis on the comments on the ledger at the Bradbury Science Museum 50 years after the end of World War II. And um, um, there were pro dropping the atomic bomb and anti dropping the atomic bomb. And a lot of the horrible discourse that we see today was in those ledgers. And the anger, I was so surprised, 50 years after the war is over, people who were angry, they were angry at Truman, they were angry at the Japan. Um, they, and it was still going on. But what I discovered in doing my research was if you had two sides, when you had two sides in the museum, telling both sides, the comments were conversational, they were discussive, like we're doing now. But when there was a perception that there was only one side in the museum, the comments were horrible, they're nasty, like what's going on in our discourse today. So you ask me what, with my background, what I would do, and that is to continue to pressure for both sides of the story to be told as honestly as they can be told. I, I don't see any other way. If we're in a democracy and we're supposed to discuss these and, and come to our own conclusions, we can say, if you do it this way, this is what happened. If you do it that way, this, this is a different outcome. But these are things to consider and then discuss and come up with our democratic response. I, we don't want an autocrat uh, telling us what to do. We want it to be um, the majority following the rules of democracy, coming up with the right answers. That's what I would suggest doing. Hey, Rafi, can I, can I jump in there real quick? Yes, you can. Go ahead. I, I, think, well, I think Nancy's point, I just reminded me of a story, and, and Nancy, that was, that was brilliant. And I was sitting at a dinner uh, table one day over in um, Rome, Italy, when I was attending the NATO Defense College with an Australian friend of mine. Um, uh, well, it's a wife of a friend of mine. He was an American a naval officer. And uh, he said, hey, my wife might bring up some things about your family history at dinner. And uh, I looked at him, I said, hey, brother, that's fine. I said, you know, we can have any conversation. Uh, we can talk about anything she wants to talk about. I said, all I ask, and this is directly to Nancy's point, all I ask is that, that we have a, you know, a, a cordial uh, collective conversation, uh, respective of each other's views. And then at the end, it's probably likely we're not going to agree. And so we rolled into the dinner and she was sitting uh, right next to me, go figure. And uh, she rolls in on me and uh, we have a, a lengthy conversation about what 
her opinions and, and my feelings and, and the facts and figures surrounding the events that happened on August 6th and 9th of 1945. And uh, it, it went on for a little bit longer than I would probably would have liked. But, uh, you know, after about 45 minutes or so, she looks at me and she says, you know, it's nice to be able to have this conversation with you and you not get, you know, overly emotional other than, of course, you know, just being a human and being the grandson of Paul Tibbetts. But, you know, she said, it's nice that we can have this conversation. And in the end, um, I, I, I don't think, you know, you, you haven't necessarily changed my view, but you give me some other things to think about. And I looked at her and I said, well, I would say the same thing. I said, I, I still feel very strongly about, you know, how I feel, but, but I, you give me some new perspectives. And then, and then as Nancy said, so take that to another level. That's, I think, how we can solve some of our more, more difficult problems. And then somebody's still got to make the decision. And then we've got to move on. And that's, that's hard. That's very hard. Uh, I'm sure it was hard for President Truman when he made the decision that he made. I mean, aren't we glad that he did? So, you know, I, I agree 100% with Nancy, and I'll get off the stage now, but I think this is really, really important that, that we are able to sit in a group or groups of people, have conversations, elevate our points of view, and then that decision maker then moves out, you know, with the decision that's going to be made. And that reminds me of a little story, too, about my thesis. There were like 1,500 entries in the, in the ledger. 70 of those were military men who had fought. I think they were mainly men. And they would identify themselves by name and give their military uh, identification. And their comments make, always made me cry because they said, I disagree with these persons who have the anti-atomic bomb use in here, but I will defend to my death their right to write those comments. And I think that's what our democracy is, is, is we understand that we defend the right to speak and the right to express ourselves. And I want to thank, I, I, nobody has said anything about, well, who, who uh, wrote the quote that you read? It was, it was uh, Winston Churchill. And I want to thank uh, Beth May and, and, and uh, Rafi for inviting me. And this has been a most interesting time for me to learn the other expressions. And, and we haven't had any questions from the audience. We do have a couple, a couple I, um, in the chat. And um, Michelle, um, if you're still here, I'd love for you to jump on, if you don't mind, at least an audio to kind of elaborate on a comment that you wrote. Um, I could read it, but I feel like I will let you say it because I thought that was pretty powerful what you were saying. And you also said the photo today has a different meaning. So I'd love to hear you kind of restate your comment for the audience and elaborate a little bit about the different meaning you see. Hi, um, thanks. I just, yeah, it's just like a, an iconic photo that everyone knows and it's the, the image of this sailor uh, grabbing the nurse, right? And hugging and kissing her. But today it has a different meaning. I mean, that looks like um, it, it's interpreted as sexual assault, right? That's, that's all that I, that I was, um, you know, thinking about, you know, but at the time, and I don't know for how many years, you know, that, that, it just has a different meaning, I think, today. You know, it's not really viewed the same way, I don't know, by uh, younger generations. So. But you were saying that if you could go back in time, you would like to witness that moment. Is that I would. Look at the joy. Look at all the people. I mean, like, I cannot, you know, like, what would, what it, what would it be like to experience that moment? You know, I mean, I, I have no idea, you know, but that photograph, a photographer just captured it so well. So I, I just always found it intriguing, you know? I mean, yeah, so. <laughs> it's interesting to me. I mean, you know, you know, we watch sports things and feel the exhilaration of when your team comes back or something like that. And, and that is such a tiny fraction. I mean, it's like in, in you know, incomparable to what that is a moment like that could be like, right? And, and I think, um, that's why to me it's impossible to imagine because if I'm jumping up and down in the living room watching sports, I can't imagine with stuff with real stuff at stake, with the kind of cost that that war came at and and the stakes, you know, um, what that would feel like. You know what I mean? And and, yeah. and that's something that you're touching on, Michelle. Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks for, um, yeah. I just, you yeah. know, during the conversations and, uh, you know, Paul Tibbetts and, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, Elva and Nancy were saying, it just kind of like made me think, you know, um, of that photograph talking about, you know, when the war ended, so. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing that. We did also have a couple of other comments, um, you know, from, from Jules saying, thank you, Elva, for your stories. We need honesty and healing um, from Jennifer. Bradbury Science Museum exhibit included both the story of the Manhattan Project and its reason and experience on the site and those who had been bombed. Also, Nancy, Heather, thank you for the kind words. I don't know if you saw that in the chat. <laughs> so when uh, when you were oh. saying nice things about Heather. Oh, oh no, I didn't see it. Yeah, I see it now. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that, that you knew about that. Yeah, she wrote that back when you were making those comments. Well, uh, I, you know, I, I worked for seven years to get the statues that are behind me, Oppie and Grove, um, conceived, funded, um, hire the sculptor, and then the years that she had to do the, to, to produce the sculptures, and then we dedicated them with 10 relatives of Oppie and Grove's uh, in May 2011, and ever since the town is to use these as an iconic expression of how Los Alamos feels about the Manhattan Project and the science that went on here and what was done. Now, it only took 28 months for the atomic bomb to be conceived, worked on, developed, and dropped, but it took me seven years to go through public art and, 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 and this is, you know, an example of what we were talking about in terms of memory and the use of public space. Um, I just wanted to get that in. But after all that work, the most important legacy is that Heather McClanahan was our director for many years and guided us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um... I do have one question for Bethany. That's, I, I would say it's maybe for Bethany is, is the chat. It says, I'm not sure this is irrelevant, but do all states have state historians? And if so, when did states begin having state historians? Does anyone know? Um, do you know, Bethany, from your experience with the Humanities Council? I know the state historian is a different thing. Um, do, so I don't. Right? I don't know what the status is on that. Um, I... I think I always assumed that there was a state historian for every state, but I think I made that assumption based on being raised here. <laughs> where, and that's, and that's separate from the humanities councils too, right? Yeah, yeah. And you'll find a, humanities councils in different states. And you'll find state historians in many states. I'm not, I'm not sure I want to say all, but I feel like I, I, at least all the ones I've looked at have had them. Um, I, I, I'm not certain though, but um, yeah, I don't know. Certainly, humanities councils like the New Mexico Humanities Council are, are really um, wonderful because they do programs like these, right? And and um, um, I follow I follow some of them myself. And um, I'm in St. Louis. I follow the Missouri one. Obviously, I follow the New Mexico one, having lived there and having some ties to it. So, um, for 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 you all, I would say at least look them up, at least look them up. If you're looking for, if you're interested in a particular state, look up the state historian and look up the um, uh, New Mexico, or excuse me, the humanities councils for each state. Um, there are also state historic preservation offices in each state um, that are required by law. I know, I know each one has, they call them chapeaux sometimes, which is SHPO, State Historic Preservation Office. And they are sometimes, they are a, a certain entity they may be called State Historic Preservation Office, or it might be a different entity that acts as a State Historic Preservation Office for the state. So you'll always have resources for a state to uh, not only look at programs like these, but to look at various work that's being done in historic preservation locally and to find different resources. And so I think, I think we're done on the questions that I could find. Um, the panelists and I will stick around just as, as people leave so that if you have any final questions pop up, but otherwise I'll hand it to Bethany to, to wrap us up. And thank you panelists again from, from my end. <laughs> I was just gonna say that I, I asked that question because you asked the panelists such a big question, like what is history? 
And, um, and then I just, you know, started to wonder about, well, do, you know, what are public histori historians currently discussing, you know, across the country, um, you know, and then, you know, does every state have, you know, a state historian like New Mexico does or said the state? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I would I would just say that you know there are public historians that exist outside of the um, state historian office as well. Do you know what I mean? So so um, there are different entities and ways that these things happen, right? You have historical societies and his, of course humanities councils, which are not just about history, right? But but um, if if you're looking for that sort of thing, there's there's usually going to be a variety of resources for public history in each state. Is that, is that fair? Is that, is that a little bit? Because I guess what I'm trying to get at is that don't look only for the state historian. I guess that's what I'm saying. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, Bethany. On that note, <laughs> um, look for the, the history where you can find it. Um, Thank you so much, Rafi. Um, it's been great to have this whole series unfold uh, over the last few months. And thank you to Nancy, Elva, and Paul so much for your time. Um, and it, we spent some time planning this, so I really appreciate the lead up time that you spent. And um, thank you so much for your insights and your personal stories. I think that it's really special that um, we've been able to have this space to, to hold multiple perspectives, multiple sides of all the stories and to really examine all the angles. I think that's so important just to echo what you said, Nancy, it's really, and Paul and Elva, all of you, <laughs> you're such advocates for, for seeing everything from multiple perspectives. So uh, thank you and thanks everybody for logging on tonight. And as Rafi said, we will wrap up, but I'll keep it open till everybody's gone. So good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Thank you guys.